This week, April and I are hosting our Roadmap to Resilience workshop, and we're feeling reflective and appreciative of where we've been over the past year. So we're resharing a conversation from last spring, inspired by our pilot cohort of Grounded and Growing, which is also the basis of Roadmap to Resilience. If you're interested in Roadmap to Resilience, days are ongoing. Make sure you register so you have access to the recordings and can join us live on Zoom every day at noon. You're listening to the Joyous Justice Podcast, a weekly show hosted by April Baskin with Tracy Guy Decker. In a complex world in which systemic oppression conditions us to deny others and our own humanity, let's dedicate ourselves to the pursuit and embodiment of wholeness, love, and thriving in the world and in our own lives. It's time to heal and flourish our way to a more joyously just future. Hi, Tracy. Hey, April. So by this time, we will have both observed our Juneteenth (laughs) celebrations and or acknowledgments. And And solstice. And the solstice is here. It is officially summer. Drums, please. I'm not going to do it again. But um, (laughs) (laughs) let's dive in. So you had a good idea of a theme that came up recently in one of our grounded and growing um sessions that we had recently, an interesting discussion and juxtaposition between how I navigate something versus how you navigate it. And um, especially since I think overall the program is going really well and we are having a great time piloting it. Um, Our participants are getting so much out of it and reflecting back so much insight and key takeaways that I think it's fun to share a little bit of a glimpse of one of the things that Um, unscripted sort of organically arose from the collective conversation we were having in the midst of one of our more recent sessions toward the end of our six week journey together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So we were talking about the sort of managing our minds and managing our emotions and, and um, a big through line for grounded and growing is kind of, interrupting or disrupting uh, numbness or inattention. And you were talking about caring for yourself and sort of boundaries that you were setting up. Um, and, and it was really interesting to see around the same sort of thing, how our different boundaries came out. I think we you should start though, I think. Yeah, yeah. And for me in that case, um, it was around as opposed to interrupting, which is a key part, I think, of navigating and working and detoxing from whiteness is is contradicting numbness and what was the other word you used inattention inattention thank you um and for me part of how i healthfully counter that and move in the direction of liberation at times is also minimize continued re-traumatization and harm and suffering uh And so, and also how to figure out how I navigate the world and the news and different stimuli in a way that both honors what's happening, tends and cares for myself and my needs as a person of color navigating it and positions me to continually be as powerful and effective as I can be. And so what came up, which... I shared at a certain point in our whiteness Chavruta program and some other programs we've done is that um, I believe that our focus and attention is power and that it's incredibly important whenever we are, that we be mindful. I think, I think the theme overall between both of us that's shared and how we do it is differently, that we be mindful about what we are ingesting and, and where that goes within our system and how we tend to ourselves as it reverberates through parts of our self that may be harmed by it and or that that input may touch upon unhealed parts of us in particular ways that may be helpful or harmful, depending. 
And so basically I forget it was, you know, I, I, it was a little bit of a, it was a bit of a tangent for where, from where we thank were. Thank you. That's that's the word I was looking for. Directing, but I think it's it's very relevant. I don't actually remember the specific comment or circumstance that led you to share. Uh, that led you to share. Yeah, this. but something about but it, it basically was that one of their one of the takeaways of one of the participants was that one of the practices that we teach in grounded and growing helps them access greater insight and awareness and honor you know, honor different feelings that arose in a circumstance and what was the default experience. And then starting to think about honoring that and moving through and recognizing different things that may need ongoing work and support. What was the intentional framework that they wanted to start to apply around that dynamic? And anyway, something about what they were sharing prompted me to want to share briefly about some of the arc of my ongoing leadership and spiritual journey and becoming around being incredibly mindful about how I use and experience attention and, um, and, and we've talked about this before a little bit in certain ways about this idea that um, I think it's incredibly important and strategic. I think it's, imp- it's a both and that I think it's incredibly important that we This is what I was talking about. This is how I started to get there. That we have, um, as thorough as we can, a really solid understanding of how oppression operates, but that also that we don't get stuck in it and continue to anchor in that. And that that I believe what we focus on grows in the energy of the problem is nearly always very different than the energy of the solution. And, And we can access the problem. This is how it came up with this person. The person, the participant was sharing that one of the questions, and I can't remember whether they generated it or if they heard it from one of us, as they were navigating through a default default version of their understanding and analysis and experience of a given circumstance before they started to move into their intentional, mindful, self-coaching framework around it was a key question they asked themselves of, what do I want? from the situation was a prompt that they were responding to. And I was speaking to, and so I went on a bit of a tangent about how potent I think that question is that helps us. And we've covered this a bit before in our episode where we talked about pivoting and joy about it's, it's a similar, it's a variation or a similar or an earlier iteration of a question around how does whatever this negative experience is, how does this further clarify what I want? And I shared that uh, during the, and that in some ways I was resistant to this idea and that I thought it was important, as I think often still in a number of different spaces that, um, that exist in the world, that people really focus on the oppression um, and anchor in that. And, and I thought, yeah, we need to do that. Like, that's really important. Um And I started to understand the spiritual and leadership and practical principle more, particularly during um, one of the peak moments during the Black Lives Matter movement around 2016 or so, um, 2016-17, where there was a combination of different variables, but where the activism was strong enough that the news, different news outlets locally and nationally were regularly covering the shootings of unarmed black people. It's not that they were happening more per se. It's just that it was actually being given attention and probably not even the full attention of all of the deaths, but more of the deaths were being covered. And I noticed, I started noticing over time as I clung to my belief that focusing on that was helpful, that it was continuing to weigh me down Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, re-traumatized is a strong word, but it was tri- It was touching upon my trauma. It was re-stimulating. Mm-hmm. It was activating old trauma and, and parts of it that were still unhealed for me about fearing for the safety of people in my life. And I started to notice over time as I was staying like valiantly, like I need to focus on this, that I felt myself contracting and getting smaller and smaller. And that my efficacy and my leadership in subtle things and day to day, my ability to follow through and do certain things that I wasn't able to show up in the ways I wanted to show up. So I took this principle that I'd heard in different spaces at different times off of the shelf where I had it of like, I'm not really feeling that, but, but this is coming from a teacher I respect. So I'm I'm not going to throw it out, but I'm not buying it. 
And I started to play with it for a little bit. And I remembered, I'm, I'm saying this much longer than I did at the time, but I'm wanting to make sure because the, in, in our, in our, in grounded and growing, there's broader context in a container that's holding these insights um, and connective tissue that we've established. And so basically what I started doing is noticing, like noticing within myself for me, uh, given that I already, ha- like I literally have a degree in sociology with an emphasis in social inequality. Like I, I'm already well aware of these issues and this is also mirroring what my family has navigated and, and um, sources of, of scarring and trauma that my family still valiantly navigates through and manages, but that, you know, things, long-term impacts of harm that um, racism and racial terrorism has had on my family and broader extended family and social circles that I started to admit to myself for me in this moment, it's not, it actually isn't helpful for me to get caught in the undertow of this re-stimulation of my trauma and, and this pain. And I began thinking back to this principle, how does this further clarify what I want? And basically what happened over a period of days and weeks is I, started to kind of organically develop a process for me as an African heritage woman, as a mixed race African heritage woman to navigate moments like this, where I established some criteria three, I don't know if I can remember them all offhand, but essentially it was like, as I would see the news come up, if hopefully, and this was around the time or shortly thereafter when a number of black lives matter and moving for black lives activists started saying we are not happy with this display of black trauma. Right. That when other people die, their bodies, that there's a specific yep. way that that this that there is theater mm-hmm. around the brutality against black people. So I, so there Almost so there were also yeah yeah and so there was also uh, I was also comforted in noticing that other people in this mm-hmm. movement I was a part of uh, were also other black folks were also saying we want to be present with this and we are actively working working to fight for justice and to fight for this to end. And something about this needs to change because it is not in service Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of our healing and our liberation. And so similarly, I started to develop some criteria around noticing, and I had to go through a similar process where, where in general, for me, with my, with how I operate, which I know a number of, like my parents and I disagree about this, but in college, I'd already done a similar version of this where I stopped paying I started paying less attention to the news because I started noticing in college, when there, particularly around oil spills, when there would be oil spills, I would literally, I wouldn't necessarily tell anyone, but I would wear all black for a few days. Like I would be in a state of mourning and I started noticing like I am incredibly sensitive. So it's interesting to me now, and I know I'm, I'm getting, I'm taking the long-winded route, but we'll, we'll get there in a moment. It's interesting to me now around some of these conversations more broadly, um, about when certain things happen, because as someone who's de- who already in general, my baseline, I'm already very sensitive to multiple things happening all the world around the world all the time, constantly in a very deep way. So I've had to reconcile that in order to continue to function in this world and work for justice. And so I developed in this specific case around this 2016, 17 period to have some criteria where is this is this in an area? Is this in a region? Is this in my region of the country or in a region where I'm from, where my voice and or my specific activism can be particularly potent? Um, is there some other way I- within uh, my sphere where I can be particularly helpful around this? Um, and there was one other criteria. It's been a while that I, I can't remember offhand. I'd have to think about it and circle back maybe potentially put it in the show notes at some point. Um, And I started using that criteria. And then based upon that criteria, I would determine how much I would expose myself to the brutality and the specifics of the circumstance. Um, How much did I want to go into that and have to do the work that I would know I would need to do of multiple days and or weeks of healing to get back to my full baseline and full capacity? And if not, if it didn't meet the criteria, so like, so for instance, you know, so I paid a bit more attention with Stefan Clark and, but I was still mindful about what was my intervention. And I found since my mom then, and 
can't remember if it's official or she's not official. At the time, she was on the board of the NAACP and was working directly with the Clark family and with the NAACP around that. I found that my best role was to be a support to my mother as mm-hmm. she was navigating that on the ground. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so, and that's what it looked like in some of those cases, or if something was happening in St. Louis, I would think about how am I resourcing and helping some of my friends and allies who are on the ground in that city doing work. And if none of those things applied and it wasn't a space, because I found, I also noticed another element that I noticed is as I was advocating for these things on social media, I noticed it was largely an echo chamber that I was basically like, it wasn't getting any response from, or getting very little response from the Jewish community, other than a few dedicated activists and that people were still in their distress and fear and shut down space. And my advocacy or expressing my pain didn't seem to be helping me actually heal. It just actually seemed to be inflaming my hurt more so than healing me and also not getting the external result I wanted. So instead I opted to do a process where I would do an internal review around, is this an issue? And in this case around racial justice, it is, you know, where that's a specific element of a larger body of work of mine. And so anytime these moments would happen, I would often opt if it didn't meet the criteria for me to go deeper in and expose myself to that re-traumatization, I would then do a review of my body of work and ask myself, am I being as brave as I can be right now? How, so am I being as brave as I can be? And also how effective, how can I be more effective? So how does this further clarify what I want? This is clarifying that I want there to be greater racial justice and I want there to be um, stronger social consciousness around these issues. So I would then look over my body of work through that lens and interrogate and investigate and analyze and assess literally down to the program level. Are there places here where I am being too coddling of some of my white students where I can mindfully in a way that also doesn't traumatize them, where I can push them more into a stretch zone and help move this issue forward with some greater speed um, without forsaking the quality of the work. And then I would make subtle or more explicit pivots strategically in my body of work. And as this was happening often, it would often be just be checking back in. Am I at the right calibration right now in terms of supporting other people? Are there other ways I can be helpful? Can I be looking on social media for folks who might be trying to get involved? Can I help connect them when I have time? What are the things I can be doing to be moving us toward greater racial justice and healing and wholeness and honesty and courage around truth and reconciliation in this country. And then after sharing all of this, later you shared a counter that I so appreciated because after I shared this in a much more concise way than I just shared it now, (laughs) um, I was feeling some tension internally of both feeling comfortable that I shared the piece I wanted to share and also being aware that at that point in time, um, everyone who was attending that session were white Ashkenazi Jews and that their racialization and their experience of that issue is different and that there's an issue around racial and white conditioning around numbing and the invisibility of suffering. And I could see people go ahead. Yeah. Invisibility or fetishization so that, uh, so that black folks are defined entirely by their oppression and their trauma. Um, and that thing that I that dynamic, dynamic that I talk about at times of like racial of like racial injustice S and M of like oh yeah like a moment of, oh oh that's painful but not actually doing like or, oh, yeah you know right there the was also like a, this weird sort of dynamic that plays out at times. There was also some of the tension that I was feeling in that moment was like you were talking about boundaries you put up to protect yourself um, and those criteria that you put up like um, does it cross the threshold that makes it worth it for me to, that makes it, um, worth it is the wrong phrase, but, um, strategic, if it's strategic, um, you know, activating of that trauma and, um, for those, and will it both be healing and or in service of justice going forward in this moment? Will that help me? In this right, moment, but nap. Right for the white folks in the room, like they have very. There's no resonance there. That's not the same sort of. Um, they don't have the same sort of um, trauma 
to be and re-stimulated. Ex- right, around, especially around race. their identity. Around, around their racial around identity. Racialization, right. And so I named that, whereas you sort of made these criteria to protect yourself and in service of the work, what I did in service of the work was actually in some ways the opposite where it was important, mm-hmm. not the opposite, but yeah, kind of a, a converse. Which makes where sense, yeah. Mm-hmm. It became important to me to actually, to counter the numbing and the inattention and and also the fetishization of pain to learn the names um, and faces of those who had been lost to racial racist violence, not in the photo of their corpse, but in their in the moments of their joy prior to that, to really mm-hmm. rehumanize or fully humanize the um, folks of color who, because of the nature of our society, something about them, their their dignity and humanity was trying to be stolen. And so my attention um, was my personal effort to counter that. And the way I described it to our participants yes. was that it, whereas when I was first activated in 2015 by the uprising in Baltimore after Freddie Gray's murder, there was this urgency. Like, okay, I see my privilege. Now what do I do about it? And I, I needed to like do something, which totally makes sense based on how I've been socialized and based on, you know, ancestral trauma that I've inherited. And there was there was no service there. So rather than intervening to fix things, I found the space to bear witness. And that, that has sense. felt like a really important part of my racial and social justice practice as a Which practice. Mm-hmm. So, and in fact, I think we've talked about this. We talked about this on the podcast about my wanting to adopt the bracha Michael Hametim, blessed is God who resurrects or revives or enlivens the dead um, as a moment of pause when another headline comes across. And I had adopted that as my first cup of coffee, (laughs) bracha, and I did not want to demean that moment of of providing dignity uh, with coffee. And so I actually have adopted a different bracha for coffee so that Michael Hametim, when I say it outside of uh, Shabbat liturgy, mm-hmm. has that specific meaning of mm-hmm. you know let this Significance. death not be in in vain. Let this death be like for a let revolution. My for a revolution exactly, and and let my a loving revolution attention and love enliven the dead. Uh, how whatever that means, their not memory, to re- right, right. You know, their memory, their humanity, their dignity, um, all of those things. So it, it was a it was a really interesting in in the moment with our participants. And I was so and relieved when you did this because I and that's this is one of those moments where I love co facilitation because I wanted that counter balance and I, and I felt like people I felt like they were appreciating what I was saying. And they were also they like, were. that doesn't apply to me. And I also, and I was thinking it also doesn't apply to you, but I also still want to share this. Experience. Right. So I was well, I, so happy when you shared that. I was like, thank you. It was so for bringing it full circle too. I think for the, us, we white folks in the room to sort of bear witness to you and the effect that this ongoing, uh, injustice has on you and mm-hmm. also find our own way to acknowledge and and and, and hold it. the nuance of mm-hmm. understanding the core principle and how it can manifest, which is something that I find with racial justice, people get very, at times people can get confused with this about a lot of things, but especially given the trauma and the complexity of this issue, it feels extra confusing. And this felt like a lovely moment where even though we didn't fully unpack it, I feel like people got the core message of being mindful about our attention and depending upon our socialization and placement and power and privilege in a given dynamic that we need to modulate and decide, right? So there are other ways in which um, I have more of your practice and it's a little bit around moments relating to American imperialism and the impact even as I'm hurt by the American state, but it's important to me as someone who in that role, I am in a non-target 
oppressor, passive, but still as usually is the case role. And I don't want that to be passive. And so how am I, when it, when it actually is messaged, how am I paying attention to the impact, the global impact at times my country is having in my name? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And I remember when this was first raised with me, which I I think I've talked about this before with a really funny, wonderful roommate. I had Asma who was, um, an Iraqi refugee. And at times I was resistant the first few times she said it. And then I was like, Oh, this is totally like, like what I learned in college about like sexism and whiteness, you know, where she was like, your people, how, how, she, she would use very explicit language, you know, but I was, I will censor it. Your people messed up my country, you know, or you messed up my country. And I was like, I didn't do it. And, but then I started being like, wait, I, the, I'm sounding what I'm saying is sounding familiar. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't sounding good. And then I was like, oh, right. No, no, no. She's what she's saying is like, has validity. Um, And I am a part of that. Right. So, so I think it was helpful to give people a sense of the agility and the flexibility as we continue to strengthen our analysis that we need to apply and start to understand some core principles and then look at the circumstances of our positioning and what's happening and figure out what is the generative liberatory and or counter oppressive um, intervention or action that is of the greatest service in this moment for me to be taking with regard to me and or who I am with whom I I am working in this moment and to hold those different pieces. And I agree with you that that played out really um, organically, very nicely. Is there anything else you want to add, Tracy? I don't think so. I think that that um, complement of each of us coming at the, a similar phenomenon that we were trying to process and use and, and be strategic about our attention and our different identities and lived experiences, making it not one size fits all. That's what I wanted to kind of get at. Yeah. And that seemingly opposite things can be profoundly aligned, even though on Uh the surface, it's like, oh, these things are very different, but they're both in service and racial justice and moving us toward a revolution of healing and wholeness, which is the kind of revolution I want. Amen. Thanks for tuning in. To learn more about Joyous Justice LLC, our team, and how you can get involved with our community, check out the info in our show notes or find us at joyousjustice.com. If you enjoyed this episode, show us some love. Subscribe wherever you're listening. Tell your people, share what you're learning and how your leadership is evolving. Stay humble. But not too humble. And keep going. Because the future is ours to co-create.